Alright, so this is our next uh, GYN procedure to talk about surgical sterilization. So there's no uh, really unique contraindications of this to, to talk about. Um, there's some things that could alter your choice of technique between the two general approaches, which are one, abdominal, and two, hysteroscopic. For example, if someone had lots of adhesions or prior abdominal surgery, that might fa favor maybe a hysteroscopic approach. But the main thing to think about with this is the things that would increase the person's chance of regret, because the indication for this is permanent contraindications contraception. So what are the two things that you should know about which increase the chance of regret? So the first is young age and the second is change in marital status. So the surprising one that doesn't seem to have a big effect is parity at the time of that the procedure is done. That one uh, isn't very strongly related to the chance of regret. And so the other thing to think about here that's kind of unique is preventing a luteal phase pregnancy and we'll talk about that in the next slide. So when you're doing this you might, you might uh, get into a talk about sort of the general types of, con of contraceptions available to people and so the way to think about that is three main groups. So the first one is the really good group and that's where the typical use and the perfect use are pretty much the same. And So those are the implanon, that's the one that goes in the arm, um, sterilization and IUDs. And the second main group is the um, hormonal contraceptives, so that's the pill, patch, or ring, and those are all, they all work about the same. And the third group is the group that doesn't work so well like uh, condoms, diaphragms, um, withdrawal, things like that. And then sort of by itself here is uh, Depro-Provaris. That's the injection in your arm you get every three months. Um, and that one's, it works noticeably better than um, the pill patch or ring, but not as good as the uh, sort of best group, like the IUDs or sterilization. And so here we'll just talk about luteal phase pregnancy. It's, it's, it is just what it sounds like, but it can kind of, be kind of confusing when you hear about it for the first time. So what's the follicular phase made of? You know, that's the menstrual phase plus the proliferative phase um, equals the follicular phase. Then you have ovulation and then you have the luteal phase. So let's say you do a surgical ster sterilization procedure like here, for example. The person could have already ovulated, the egg could have traveled down, um, into the, down the tube into the uterus, and then the person could actually get pregnant uh, after the procedure is done because ovulation's already happened. It doesn't matter that you've occluded the tubes now. Um, the cat's out of the bag, so to speak, already, so the person could get pregnant here. So you want to make sure that this ovulation doesn't happen. So what's the most common way that people prevent ovulation from happening? It's using uh, oral contraceptive pills. Oral contraceptive pills work by preventing ovulation. So if a person's not on one of those, you need to make sure that they that they start something so that this ovulation doesn't happen and they don't get pregnant. And then, so during the 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 next phase, so when you get to the next menstrual menstrual phase, proliferative phase, and then you have ovulation. Well, then it doesn't matter if they have ovulation because you've already done the procedure. The tubes are already are already occluded and it's it's okay if they have an ovulation then so they they don't have to be on um, OCPs after they've after they've already gone on to the next cycle or after after they've had their their next menstrual period. Um, this the exception for this is doing the hysteroscopic approach or the ESHR, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so the two general abdominal approaches. We'll start with the abdominal approaches. So uh, the the first way to do is you do it laparoscopically. If you do that, you usually use the ring clip or electrosurgery. And then the second way through the abdominal wall is a mini laparotomy and the procedure that you do there is typically a, uh, a Pomeroy procedure. And then there's the hysteroscopic approach which is where you go through the vagina or the uterus and then what the device you use there is called the Esher. So we'll get the, the Pomeroy or the mini laparotomy procedure out of the way first and so you should know why why you can do this in the postpartum period. This is typically done um, soon at right after someone gives birth. So in the, f the first day or so after someone gives birth you can do this uh, Pomeroy procedure with a mini laparotomy, so that's a very small incision in from umbilically, so right under the belly button, and you can do this because the uterus is very large and the sub umbilical area is very thin. So you make this incision, um, you gain you gain access to the inside of the peritoneum, you find the fallopian tubes, and the procedure itself, you just grab the tube with a Babcock clamp. So I'm showing grabbing the tube here. You pull the tube up and you make what they call a knuckle out of the tube. So the tube comes up here like this, and then it comes up here like this. So you've made a knuckle out of the tube, you tie the bottom of the tubes together, and then you you cut and you incise above above where you've tied, so you chop the knuckle out that you've created. So you have this piece of fallopian tube like this that's been excised. And so you take the part that's been excised, you send it off to pathology, make sure that the tube has been entirely transected, which is one of the benefits of doing the doing it this way, of making a partial uh, salpingectomy. And then you, this is this suture is left in place. It's an it's an absorbable suture. So over time, um, 
the suture will go away and the tube will be left like this. And you'll have, um, this will be scarred off from the incision that you made. You'll have the tube here, you'll have the section that was removed, and then you'll have the rest of the tube here. So that's the Pomeroy procedure for mini lap typically associated with mini laparotomy, and it's a partial salpingectomy. The good th one of the good things about it is you get a histologic confirmation. Um, so we could we could also since we're on the slide now we can just go over the parts of the of the fallopian tube. So what's what's number eleven? What's this part? We'll do it quiz style. That's the fimbriae of the tube. How about number ten? What's this called? In the infundibulum. So what's this big section here? Number thirteen. It's called the ampulla. The ampulla connects up with the isthmus, and the isthmus is what connects the fallopian tube to the uterus. This whole area here is called the cornea, and then the ins inside of the tube. So if you're looking, doing something hysteroscopically, you're looking at the inside of the tube from the inside of the uterus. That's called the the ostium. Ostium. Okay, so now we'll move on from the, the Pomeroy and we'll go to the other abdominal wall approaches. So this is, la if you're doing a procedure laparoscopically, you, you have to do the general sort of laparoscopic setup. Um, the main thing here is that you actually grab the tube, so not the round ligament or the uterovarian ligament. And the way you make sure that you've, ground the, the, you've grabbed the right thing is that you see that it's connected to the isthmus. Remember, the isthmus is the part of the tube that connects uh, to the uterus. So there's three main things that you can do when you're doing the procedure laparoscopically. So there's the you can apply a ring, which is made of silicone. You can do electrosurgery, or you can use a clip, and we'll just briefly talk about each of those. So, when you're applying the ring, you draw you draw the tube um, into this device here with the ring applicator, and you place a ring around it. And the main concern here is that you don't uh, draw the tube in too quickly and, tran and transect the tube, because you want you want to bring the tube in and apply the ring around the tube while it's while it's intact. The with, the, with electrosurgery, the only thing to note here is, you, is sort of where you could do this. You can imagine, so you see the tube here, you have kind of the fimbria, ampulla, isthmus, connecting to the uterine part. There's probably, there's a lot of places you can imagine, well, should I do it here, here, here. You find the cornea of the, of, the, of the uterus where the tube connects, and you just do it a couple centimeters away from there. That's where you apply the electrosurgery. And then there's the clip. That's the third thing we'll talk about, the, the final sort of main way that it's done laparoscopically. It's kind of like similar to the to the ring, and you have the spring-loaded applicator. It's kind of like a gun. You you pull the trigger, and it applies this um, locking jaw clip. And so you want to make sure that you get the entire tube inside of the clip. You apply the locking jaw. This part detaches and stays it stays with the tube. You pull the you pull the device out through through the port. Um, it causes the tube to necrose off. And the the concerns here are that the this clip after the tube necroses off, this this clip that you've applied could, could sort of float away, and it could be moving around in the in the abdomen and the peritoneum it cause irritation, adhesions, or bur bury itself into an organ. This is really rare, it's just sort of a theoretical concern, but you could potentially have this sort of free floating thing in the abdomen. And, th and then the main sort of more practical thing is you want to make sure that you get the entire tube, um, because unlike doing the Pomeroy procedure, which is associated with the mini laparotomy, you're not um, going to have a, a partial sap injection that you can send off to pathology to make sure you've gotten the entire tube, so you wouldn't want to get um, sort of part of the tube, occlude part of it, and and leave part of it open, which could be a potential way that this procedure could fail. So the we've talked about the two main abdominal approaches. Now I'll move on to the hysteroscopic approach. And so the thing they use there is called Esher, and it's a micro insert made of stainless steel. The outer coil is made of nickel and titanium. So this is a compressed device that you put in the proximal fallopian tube and then deploy it. So when you deploy it, it expands and fills up the tube. That irritates the surrounding tissue stimulates it to grow, um, sort of scar and fibrose off the tubes that the, the egg can't travel travel past and go into the uterus. And so the main, uh, one of the big differences here is that you're, this is done, um, when this is done it takes some time for this for this to happen. You're not transecting the tube and immediately occluding it. So it takes a couple months um, to be sure that, or to before you want to check to make sure that the, the tubes are occluded. And so the way you check to make sure that they're occluded is doing what's called a hysterosalpingogram. And so instead of just having to wait until the next um, menstrual cycle, you, ha you actually want to wait um, three months, do the HSP, hysterosalpingogram, and then once you've seen that it's occluded, okay, then you can stop um, the oral contraceptives. So placing this and confirming that it's there. So some of the contraindications to doing this, you don't want to do this if the person's having an infection like PID, and then all the general contraindications to doing a hysteroscopic procedure, which you can um, hear about in hysteroscopic um, talk, and then if a person's pregnant, you don't want to do this. Um, contra contraception, like we said, so three months. 
And this can be done in the office um, without anesthesia, which is a different, which is different than, for example, doing this la laparoscopically. So you ins insert the device, you put it in the working channel of the hysteroscope, you find the the ostium, um, insert it, and deploy. And then so this thing has the device itself has some coils on it, and then that's how you decide how far you've gone into the into the tube, and you want to make sure that it's in the right distance. So let's say this is the tube here. This is the device you've placed. You can count the coils that you can still see in the uterus to get an idea about how um, far you've placed it. So confirmation, this is the HSP that I was talking about before. So you can see the dye um, here filling up, um, going to the uterus, and you can see it coming out of the tubes into the peritoneum here. So this would be um, not occluded tubes. If, you, if the tubes were occluded, you would you wouldn't see any of the dye going past um, where the Esher device was placed. You wouldn't see the dye getting into the peritoneum. All right. So complicated indications are thing to, things to think about in general. Like all these things we're talking about, they're rare. They're, these, are, these are safe procedures. So um, you could have expulsion, perforation, just like when you're doing anything, histor any hysteroscopic procedure, you need to think about perforating um, the uterus or perforating through the tubes. And then you have an increased risk of atopic pregnancy. If the person does get pregnant, that's, that makes sense, right? You have this sort of fibrose scarring area. If the person happens to, to get pregnant, it's more likely that the um, pregnancy will implant in the tube instead of making it into the uterus um, because of, of that sort of blockage that you've created. And then another consideration is that now there's um, a piece of metal in the uterus, so if it's a path for electricity to travel, so if, the, if you're doing, you wouldn't want to do monopolar surgery, for example, or endometrial abrasion using electricity and if if you need a review of um, the sort of what monopolar surgery mono, monopolar surgery is or why you wouldn't want to do it um, you can just uh, watch the um, laparoscopic access procedure I'm pretty sure I talk about it there and so some some just general questions things you should know about before doing this um, you should know about in general so how do contraceptives work basically the, um, if you're talking about hormonal contraceptives it's a good thing to remember so um, just just as just as a review, you give the uh, progestins and the estrogen. They cause feedback to the hypothalamus, which is normally releasing GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. That goes to which part of the pituitary, the anterior, or the posterior? It goes to the anterior, which causes the LH FSH release, and then that that stimulates ovulation. So by giving the sort of the chronic dose of progestin and estrogen, it, it feedback inhibits the hypothalamus um, and the pituitary from causing. Um, ovulation that's that's how they work and then the knowing about why you use the mini laparotomy in the postpartum so what's unique about the postpartum period which makes it a good time to use this remember that the uterus is really big the area under the belly button is very thin so you can gain access to the tubes with just making that little infra umbilical incision and sort of avoiding having to do a laparoscopic procedure you should know the parts of the fallopian tube so just starting sort of distal um, distal meaning near the ovary um, and going proximal what are they so they have the fimbriae, then you have the infundibulum, you have the um, the big part, the ampulla, then you have the isthmus, which connects the ampulla to the uterus, and then you have finally the uterine portion of the tube. You should also know the types of surgical sterilization and sort of what they're associated with. So the pomeroy, that's a procedure that you that you should know. Um, that's associated that you, you do that um, typically with a mini laparotomy. And there's there's other named procedures, other sort of ways to do a partial um, salpingectomy. For example, there's um, a uh, Croner procedure where you you basically chop off the end of the tube, you chop off the fimbria, the end of the tube. There's an, a procedure called the Irving procedure. You chop off, um, you, you you do a Pomeroy essentially, but then you take the proximal portion of the tube and then bury that in the anterior uh, part of the uterine wall. Then those, just like most of the other proce named procedures, really aren't used very much. The Pomeroy or some sort of slight variation of the Pomeroy is what's commonly used. Then you have um, laparoscopically, you have the ring, the clip, or electrosurgery, which are ways to surgical sterilization laparoscopically and then um, there's a hysteroscopic approach which uses Esher so you should know about that and then something you could ask which I'm curious about so why when you're doing a mini laparotomy why do you do the par partial salpingectomy so why couldn't you do a mini laparotomy and then use a clip or ring or electrosurgery or something and then if and then conversely so if when you're doing a laparoscopic procedure why not do um, a partial salpingectomy laparoscopically is it a time concern is it uh, sort of a technical um, type of problem. And then you could always ask about, you know, the per the person's um, preferences. You know, if are, do you like do you like to do um, a ring clip electrosurgery? You could ask them. You know, I was reading about the Pomeroy procedure. It seems like that's the main one that that gets used. Do you do you, do you use any alternative like an Irving or a Croner or any um, other way of doing partial salpingectomy? So those are some questions you could ask. And that is our review of um, surgical sterilization.